We want to get back to studying the Word. Uh, I'll continue in 2 Samuel. Uh, we've gone through some really rough ground in studying uh, this book. Uh, of course, we saw David at uh, some of his highest moments as a king. Uh, but now we saw chapter 11 and following how he goes into the pits. Uh, and uh, what a warning to any of us, those of us who love God uh, and want to uh, live for him. What a warning to make sure we keep our eyes on him and not believe our own press. And so this morning we're going to be looking at how God brings hope to those who've gone through misery and are going through misery uh, as we understand the birth of Solomon and God's divine restoration of hope. We have a short portion to read. Please stand, if you will. Last stretch you may get for a while. Some of you are thinking, but it's just a short portion of Scripture. God can multiply the loaves. Let's read this in unison out loud. Here we go. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her. And she gave birth to a son and he named him Solomon. Now Shem loved him and sent word through Nathan the prophet. And he named him Yedyaga for Hashem's sake. Father, we thank you so much for the birth of hope. Some of us are here needing to have hope birth in our souls. Some of us are distracted by the issues of life around us with all the moral issues in this country uh, that we, it looks like such a tremendous spiritual attack and that our nation is faltering, our nation is failing, not living up to the very truth that we put on our money in God we trust. And so we need to have hope and others, Lord, have family issues personal issues, health issues, financial issues, all kinds of tsuris and trouble. Lord, we need hope. And so we pray that Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, uh, would give hope to our hearts even as we study the word and understand through the birth of Shlomo, the birth of Solomon, the kind of hope we have, even as Solomon pointed to the one who is the greater king, the king of kings. And all this we give thanks for and praise your name for, for we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Please be seated, if you will. And so uh, we see here it says she gave birth to a son. And so Solomon is David and Bathsheba's firstborn son to uh, live out his life, the firstborn of their children uh, to live out their life. They had four, ch uh, four children altogether that live, uh, but Solomon was the first. Uh, they had an earlier birth, which we saw, but that child died. Uh, and what a horrible period of time they're going through. Uh, certainly Solomon was born at a low point, uh, so to speak, uh, for this couple. A dismal time for both parents as they're coming out of this greatest catastrophe of their life. And there's nothing worse than the loss of a child. And there's nothing that not just breaks hearts but can destroy our souls, crush us, feel crushed by it. And so we want to understand that uh, our lives as well can be reflected in the very situation because some of us here are enduring pain and loss, even as many of us are still praying for our sister Wanda. Uh, and as she is, you know, being restored, uh, getting her sea legs back after the loss of her wonderful husband, Pat. Uh, and so we understand these kind of things. People going through misery, going through loss, all of these things are just part of this side of heaven. And so this portion of scripture was intended to give us hope, to remind us that our problems are not the last word on our life. God's word is always the final word. Our lives are founded upon his word, not the circumstances which can change, but upon his word that is sure and amen. And so when uh, we go back in the story, we realize that David had seduced Bathsheba and she was pregnant and then murdered her husband in order to quickly marry her before she started showing. Uh, and so God then uh, brought David to terms where David confessed that he was the sinner, that he had sinned against the Lord. And then God, of course, forgave him. You say, well, why would he forgive him? Because of the finished work of Yeshua. For those who are visiting, for those who are live streaming, let me just mention to you that the most important matter in the Bible is the finished work of the Messiah. 
Uh, this was something that was anticipated by faith to all those, uh, whether it be Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, David, Isaiah, whomsoever. Uh, they all anticipated what God would uh, provide in the Messiah. And those of us who live now, as we have studied before, all of us appropriate by faith, the same faith of Abraham. They anticipate and we appropriate, always looking to provision in the Messiah. And so David too, a believer, uh, a man after God's own heart, stumbled, fell, had a cata spiritual catastrophe. Uh, but even a David ha could be forgiven because of the finished work of Messiah. And I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you have done. I don't know what kind of sins are haunting you, what kind of guilt you're living with. But I want you to know there's a guilt offering for you in the Messiah of Israel. There is forgiveness. If you will recognize, confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness for the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7 and 9. And so we want to understand the very truth of our lives is something David depended on as well as he anticipated what would be provided. But nonetheless, there are consequences. As we saw it before, there is forgiveness, but that doesn't mean there won't be consequences. If you rob a bank and you're not good at it, uh, and some of you just don't look like overachieving bank robbers to me, but so you get caught. Uh, and so what happens? You see, oh, what a dummy I was like, for robbing a bank. Oh, Lord, forgive me. And by, by your faith in Yeshua's death, you're forgiven of your sins. Your bank robbery sins are forgiven. You're still going to have a prison ministry for 20 years uh, because there are consequences. There are consequences. I can't go into all the consequences. And so when you are going to be uh, angry at people, you say, it's only in my heart. There are consequences to sin. Better confess quickly. Be cleansed before the consequences get worse and worse. The anxiety and the corruption, it all comes when you merely sin in your heart, let alone say it out loud and then have to apologize as we'll get into. But in any case, they had the consequence of a divided home, murderous, rebellious family, and the death of David's first baby prior to Solomon. And so you, you, you can only ask, if you're going through these kind of horrors, you wonder, can there be real life, genuine life, a life to be lived with joy after such a horror, after you go such, through such misery? The answer is yes, for a Solomon was to be born. A Solomon born, and this is God's hope for their family and for you as well. And so if your family's in disarray, on the verge of disaster, uh, or has just come through a tragedy that uh, we don't, we won't, I'm so concerned that it might sound we're being dismissive of pain. Not at all. We understand these things, how awful they could be, how horrible they could be. I want you to know there's someone greater than your problem. I'm not trying to deny the size of your Goliath. I want you to know David was victorious because he saw someone bigger than his problem. There's someone bigger than the pain. That's where we need to put our focus on the Lord and what he has done for us. And so God has hope for all of us for a greater than Solomon has come. Uh, and he is the hope of the world. And so for 20 more years, David's going to be living out the consequences from his actions. But even so, he will have hope and joy in the midst of all of it, in the midst of his consequences, he'll have He'll know that, uh, that the truth is he's going to be with Hashem. He's going to be in heaven forever and ever. And so we want to understand the same is for us. Some of us may be living out consequences. That could be from a foolish financial situation we got ourselves into. Or it could be from a, 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 a relationship problem uh, that we caused. And so there are consequences. But God can bless you if you live faithfully now in the midst of your circumstances as you trust him through it all, even as David found out for himself too. And so this is the hope that we have. For there's one greater than Solomon. He has come and we have hope because of him. 
Moving on now, the outline in your bulletin, Solomon and the sovereignty of God. We'll take a, a brief peek at that in this section of the scripture. Uh, Solomon and the restoration by God. Uh, Solomon and the promises of God, promises from God. And Solomon and the Messiah of God. We'll take a look at this as we go through the text. Here we go. And so it says there she gave birth to a son. We see the sovereignty of God in this matter. You say, what do you mean the sovereignty of God? Isn't it, doesn't this strike you as strange? Doesn't it strike you as odd that God in advance knows everything that's coming, all the problems, all the difficulties, all, all my, he knows all my failures that are yet coming up. <laughs> you know, if I knew about those failures yet coming up, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning, you know. I'd be so, oh no, Lord. But God knows his grace is my sufficiency, and therefore all things work together for good to those who love God called according to his purpose. His purpose will be done. And that's what we see here, even the death in the, in the birth of Solomon. And so God had planned out through the Davidic line that Solomon would come, uh, to produce through that line the Messiah for the redemption of humanity. And God had planned this out to include all the failures in the Davidic line, all the issues of life that go on. Uh, why? Because God understands his grace is sufficient as opposed to we being sufficient. And so God, uh, when Adam and Eve, he created Adam and Eve able to sin. They were able to sin. They didn't have to sin. How many of you are able to sin? Raise your hand. Oh, you're over. You're over educated in that, aren't you? Okay. You're able to. Doesn't mean you gotta sin. Remember, then why do I sin? Because sin is stupid. Sin is delusional. Uh, sin. It doesn't make sense. Afterwards, you say, "What was I doing? What was I thinking?" Nonetheless, Adam was created able to sin, uh, but yet, there, and when he sinned, there was a promise of a redeemer, of uh, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In the eternity past, God had planned it all out with Yeshua in mind, with the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. And so Adam's sin was foreknown and addressed in the Messiah. Uh, the bloody skins that God had placed upon Adam and Eve, uh, picturing the covering of blood uh, that we all trust in even now. And so God redeems Israel uh, from Canaanite assimilation. Some of us may not have been here for our studies on these matters, uh, but nonetheless, uh, Israel, uh, the children of Jacob, the sons of Jacob, uh, were all becoming like Canaanites. Uh, they were assimilating into Canaanite pagan culture as you read through uh, uh, Genesis. And so when you realize that, God wanted to secure them from becoming just another Canaanite group. How? By having Jacob's ten sons sell their brother Joseph into slavery. You say, that's a plan from God? Selling their brother Joseph into Egyptian slavery. And then having Joe... Oh God, aren't you great? Having Joseph thrown into prison just so he can then get to the palace in order to keep, bring Israel out of Canaan that they may grow as a great nation in Egypt of all places. And so God's sovereignty keeps Israel as a people uh, and Jewish people as Jewish people in Messiah. Uh, How does he do this? By the same grace of God. Uh, this is the work of God in securing the testimony that brings glory to God, and only glory to God. And so God foresees that Israel will nationally reject the Messiah. For those who are familiar with Isaiah chapter 53 and many other portions of Scripture, it's prophesied 700 years in advance that the Messiah uh, would be rejected by our people. And so, uh, and why? It says, so the good news would go to the Gentiles. Does God love the Gentiles that much? You betcha. God loves Jews and Gentiles the same. God only has one speed. It's everlasting love. 
for all who trust in him. Uh, he has it for everyone, but you only receive that love by faith in Yeshua. And so the Gentiles, by God's mercy, would then turn around. They're calling. This is why it's an important value in our community here. You say, well, I'm not Jewish. You have a calling from God. And the calling is found through the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, as Paul said, uh, that Gentiles were saved to make Israel jealous. Romans 11, verse 11 and 31. And so Israel would then nationally trust in the Messiah, according to all the prophets. Zechariah 12, 10, to look unto me whom they have pierced, as it says. Which brings about then the second coming and the kingdom of Israel. You say, that's the plan of God. How circuitous. I mean, I'm fortunate if I can get from A to B. You know, but God has the whole thing worked out in such a way that only God would get glory for it. That God would get the glory. That's the point. And if your life seems a little circuitous now, a little unclear to you now, what do you do? Trust the Lord. And his word will be a lamp unto your feet. Trust the Lord. He will guide you with his eye upon you. Trust the Lord. You say, well, I'd like to know what's happening. Why? So you can feel like you're in control? Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Many of us are little glowworms. If you ever saw a glowworm, you say, are they kosher? No, but they're, just think of yourself as an unkosher glowworm. You say, what do, I, what do you mean I'm an unkosher glowworm? Well, you only have enough light for the next step. And so God doesn't give you all that you may want to know about. He tells you to trust him one step at a time. And so this is actually the way God works. But who is sufficient for these matters? Who can understand this? And so God had promised a son to David who would build the temple. We saw that. We studied very thoroughly in 2 Samuel 7. And that would secure the Davidic line. Uh, and that son would only be born after the darkest chapter in David's life where he was an adulterer and a murderer, and but that son would then represent God's forgiveness because Solomon, that son, would be the one who built the temple, and those temples would be a place for sacrifice, bloody sacrifices, because only the shedding of blood brings forgiveness of sins. And this would reconcile sinners with God. And so all things working together for good according to God's sovereign purpose. God sovereignly working these things out. Who is sufficient for these things? And you may be going through your own level of misery. And I'm not trying to discount your problems at all. I'm not trying to be dismissive at all of the pain you're enduring. I just want you to know that God brings forgiveness uh, and brings with that forgiveness the opportunity to then live faithfully in your consequences so you can glorify him. Uh, wherever you go, whatever you're doing, in the midst of your pain. That is, if you will believe God and believe his word. You can see the scripture I have up there from Romans 8, 28. Uh, but also the same thing is repeated throughout the word of God. As Joseph told his verstinken of brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. It doesn't even use it for good. He planned the whole thing out for good. It all worked together for good. And so through, we trust in Yeshua through it all. And then you, if you will trust, I just want to make you this offer. Job opportunity. You say, does it pay well? Not too well, but the benefits are out of this world. If you will trust the Lord through your circumstances, through your trials, if you will believe God for his all-sufficient grace, if you will believe that the blood of Yeshua is sufficient for you, if you will believe these things, you will be God's instrument of grace to the world around you. You will be their Solomon of hope. You'll be their instrument of hope in the dark, dismal world where they're going through pain and problems and trials just like you, but they don't know where to turn. But God has you in those circumstances, in those situations, in those relationships, so that you can be an instrument of grace, good news, uh, about a God who cares about them all through the issues of their life. You say, but you don't know what I've done, how I messed up my life. I don't need to hear the details because I know 
this to be a fact. God is greater than your problems. Get your eyes off of that, uh, forgetting what lies behind. Press on to what lies up ahead, looking unto Yeshua, the author and the finisher of our faith. This is how you'll have the victory even after the worst defeat of your life. God will give you that victory. And so we now come to the second point, Solomon, the restoration by God. It says David comforted his wife. And so the word comfort and naham, it's used in the scripture. I have a bunch of scriptural references on the screen. You say, why do you put so much information on the screen? Because it will be uploaded uh, soon. Uh, and then many people from around the world, they study it. Uh, and actually, you know, you can stop it and start it again and get all the scriptures down and study it more fully. But I just want to note for you quickly here uh, that that word is used for compassion, consolation, sorrow, even repentance. And so David consoled her by staying with her. You remember when he first raped her, it was a power rape, to understand it that way. He was an authority as king. Not much he could do about it, if you understand that matter. And so what it was, he, got, he, just, he, he just vented his lust. All he did was kind of just gratify his lust. He didn't care about her at all. He couldn't care less about her and sent her back wherever she was living, next door as it were. He couldn't care, but now he's completely different. Now he's looking to comfort her. He's looking to care about her, to be loving towards her. You can see a whole different approach. This is what happens when repentance comes to the heart of a husband. The husband, therefore, sees it very different. Because even as God is the comforter, when you're in a time of trouble and trial, you don't know where to turn, God is the comforter. And then you husbands, when you trust in the Lord, you become an instrument of his comfort to your dear spouse who has to endure all kinds of difficulties because she's married to a dodo like you. Now, some of you are looking around like, does everyone know I'm a dodo? Yes, we all know it. You might as well just fess up and trust the Lord. And so because of David's deep repentance, he had so changed his mind about his deeds, his, his awful sins, that he's now living in a quite an apologetic uh, approach to his wife, a uh, life of comfort towards her. All the grief he had caused that woman and all that she had to endure and so repentance to God is followed by an apology to people. I know there are some here who think, well, I'll never apologize to that person because they, they had something to say about the problem too. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is your response. You need to apologize to people. You repent before God and apologize to those you offended. And you say, well, I'm not going to apologize. Then you didn't repent before God. The Bible says as you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. Are you a liar about hating your brother? No, that you're honest about. You're a liar about loving God. If you love God, you're going to love your brother. This is how it works. One size fits all. The same love that God that is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit when we come to faith in Yeshua, Romans 5, 5. That same love of God that's poured out into our heart. Not only will we love God with all our heart and soul and might, but we'll love our neighbor as ourselves. The same love, it works both ways. So if you don't have one, you don't have the other. You, if you're repenting before God, you're apologizing to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your neighbors, to your co-workers, whomsoever you offended, even though you think, well, they had a part. You deal with your part of it. You repent for your part of it. You say, what if I don't? The blessing of God doesn't work in, in unrepentant souls. If you're hardening your heart to God, you are therefore cutting off the very blessings. But if you know these things, John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you who do them. It's in the doing that we show our faith. It's in the implementation of the truth. That's how the truth sets us free. And so we want to understand the issue here for true repentance because faith 
without works is still dead. And so David's encouragement, uh, maybe his comfort to Bathsheba, was like, according to the, in the Greek translation of this section of scripture, it's called the Septuagint. That's uh, the Greek translation of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew scriptures. The word that's used there is parakaleo, uh, which is translated to comfort, to exhort. And so perhaps in his comforting of her, he was not only comforting her personally, but he was also doing what husbands should do, urging his wife to trust the Lord. Let's trust God through this. Let's, we don't have all the answers, but we can trust God through this. He was urging her with the word parakaleo, exhorting her, encouraging her to trust the Lord, uh, that God can still use us. God is, that we are forgiven. We have to endure problems, but God is with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We encourage one another accordingly, and that God can still use us, and that through you, Bathsheba, there may yet be that son born, as he will be. Uh, that bo son born, uh, that'll be the hope for the world, anticipating the truth of the Messiah, the King of Kings. And so you say, well, hold it a second. What are you saying here? Well, what he's doing, he's telling her in the midst of her pain and the problems and the trials, trust God. Trust God. See, some of us have gotten through situations, and we may think we're over it, but we don't trust God. We're not going to follow God with a whole heart. No, no, we're going to get pretty cynical about it when we hear these things, like God will never leave you or forsake you. Yeah, well, how come this happened? How come that happened? How come I lost my job? How come, you know, uh, the bank for, uh, took my home away? How, how, what's going on with this? I mean, and you may have come to a place where you can't trust God. Well, that is because you haven't yet come to him recognizing his all-sufficient grace for you and that God has a purpose for your life that includes the difficulties, that includes the trials, the troubles. Listen, the plan of God for your life includes your problems. For when he says all things work together for good, he doesn't just mean the good things. He means all things work together for good. And therefore, if you repent of your sin, you will there find God being able to transform matters. He'll take the broken pieces of your life and make you into a masterpiece of grace. This is what God can do if you will trust him. But the question is, can God be trusted with all the evil in this world, with all the problems? It's okay to talk a good game here on Shabbat morning. But what? We live in a real world. We live with real problems. There's real issues out there. Well, yeah, will God be able to be trusted in the midst of that? What do you think? Amen. He can be. Yes. You can trust him in the midst of your trials out there and wherever you are. It's not just for Shabbat morning. It's for every day of the week, every hour. Whether you're going to Poland or whether you're going to... Uh, Salisbury, whatever it may be, God's grace is your sufficiency. He can be trusted. But maybe you have not yet come back to trusting him. You know, I remember when my, dad, my father died, I was witnessing to him like crazy. Uh, even when he went unconscious, I continued whispering the good news into his ear. My, my father, a blessed memory, he was always a, a stubborn man, even when he was unconscious. He kept shaking his head, no. <laughs> Trust in Yeshua. <laughs> I went through three months after his death, angry at God. I wasn't able to receive any counseling. I was, uh, my heart was so broken, knowing the destiny of my father. My heart was so broken. It took three months before I could receive counsel to accept the truth that the God, you know, the judge of all the earth will do right. Uh, no one loved my father more than God did. More than he, he loved more than I loved my father. And so I had to entrust God with this and find healing when I can trust him. So I understand what it's like to go through such pain. But I'm telling you now, 
He'll never leave you or forsake you, even if you've turned your eyes off of him. He can't stop looking at you. He loves you. He cares about you. And in all your afflictions, he is afflicted, Isaiah 63, 9. And therefore, the Holy Spirit is grieving with you over the pain that you're enduring. God cares about you. He loves you. You can trust him with this problem, even though you may not understand why the problem occurred, even though you may not understand what the issues really are. And therefore, you want to understand, oh, if I only understood it, maybe I can control it. No, no, no. It's bigger than you. And therefore, you need to trust in God that's bigger than all, greater than all. He's trustworthy. And Yeshua is death in your place. His death for your sins. Yeshua is sacrifice for your sins. It's God's proof of his love. For while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. This is the love of God demonstrated. This is God's love proven to us now and forever. So in the midst of your trials, look to Yeshua. Trust in him, and healing will come. Help will come. Encouragement will come as you look to him and trust in him through all these things. And though we may abuse our free will and therefore must endure awful consequences, you know, God gave us free will, like putting a, gu a gun in the hands of a child, uh, gave us free will. We, you know, the first thing we do is abuse it even though that be the case and have to endure the consequences, yet God, because his grace is sufficient, he can turn your misery into a victory and make victims into victors. God can make you more than a conqueror through him who loves. If you will trust him, if you look to him, cast your anxiety, your cares, your pain upon him, dump on God, give it all to him, and he'll work it all together for good for what was meant for evil against you. God meant it for good. Trust God again. And so we come now to the promises and the names of this child. Uh, Shlomo, uh, Solomon. Uh, Shlomo comes from the same root uh, for the word for peace. We say shalom, you know, coming and going. You know, for visitors here, um, some of you are visitors with us, and we wish you shalom. And then when we leave you, we'll say shalom. It doesn't mean we don't know whether we're coming or going. But it means peace. May you have the Prince of Peace in your life and the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension. This is the name Shlomo. And so we understand that when she gave birth to the boy, David named him Shlomo. Why he do that? Because God had prophesied before the birth of Shlomo. Uh, before the catastrophe had taken place. I need you to read with me. It's hard to understand how God is able to do this stuff. Read with me from 1 Chronicles 22, verse 9 uh, and 10. Let's read that section out loud together on the right side of the screen. Here we go. Behold, a son will be born to you, who shall be a man of rest, for his name shall be Solomon. And I'll give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. And so before the event ever took place, God prophesied to David that there would be a child and you would name him Shlomo, peace. Uh, why? Because of the work he would do in building the temple, the house for God's name, etc. And so we want to understand that he represents God's peace uh, with David and for David's people and for all through the temple that Shlomo would build. Why is that? Because the temple is where the bloody sacrifices or where it made atonement for those who studied with us. You know Leviticus 17:11, that forgiveness of sins comes through the bloody atonement. No other forgiveness available but by the blood and so we want to understand the temple what it pictured it prefigured of course the perfect sacrifice of messiah uh, who, whom we have peace with god as we have faith in yeshua peace with god through his sacrifice for us and so the second name that was given through nathan nathan comes on the scene and says, by the way, the Lord just told me, I want you to name him uh, Yedidya. Uh, you say, what do you mean, Yedidya? What's that? Uh, the Lord loved him. It's about love. And you say, well, God loves me too. Sure, he loves you too. And so this speaks of the kind of love for us through the temple work of Yedidya. Uh, Jedidiah, as we say in English here. Uh, and so well, that means uh, the beloved of God. He sent word through Nathan the prophet. 
about God's love. This is a prophetic truth to this child. He has these two names from God, uh, which, are about, which are all about God, peace and love. Uh, the first name has to do with God's peace. And then the reason for that peace is because of God's love. You see, Yeshua is God's love gift. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so want to understand the love gift. And through that love gift, we have peace with God. This is God's desire. Not just to forgive your sins, but to have a relationship with you. A wonderful, glorious relationship. A shalom relationship, a relationship of peace, of well-being, of wholeness, which comes through the Messiah of Israel. And so these names identify us with God and with his calling to David Shlomo and to you as well. The Prince of Peace is God's love gift for all of us. For there's no peace with God apart from the atonement in the Messiah. Let me repeat that. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how you're minding your P's and your Q's. How you make sure you don't say things out loud. Uh, all the stuff that you think gets you in good with the guy upstairs. All that is a vanity, foolishness, and deceit. No. The only thing that gets you right with God is the atonement he provided through the Messiah of Israel for all who will believe, Jew and non-Jew alike. And so this is the work of God that we proclaim, we believe in, trust in, and communicate to everyone else as well. And so God proved his love to Israel by delivering Israel from Egypt. And so God therefore demonstrates his own love for us by delivering us from the power of sin, the penalty of sin. That while we were yet sinners, Messiah died on our behalf. While we were yet sinners, while we're still cursing, while we're still all the awful things our heart may be doing, though it may not do it out loud, but all the evil things. While that was going on, Yeshua is God's demonstration of love for us in dying for our sins. And so sacrifice reveals love. Love is revealed in sacrifice. God loves you, and Yeshua's sacrifice proves it. Do you love your kids? What you give up, what you give up, then reveals your love to them. You say, what do you mean? Not what you give them, what you give up for them. When you decide to spend time with them, not just make it up with a present, they need your presence. They need you to be with them. What you give up for their sake. Give up that football. You say, football started again? Give it up for your children. Give it up for your spouse. Give it up. Sacrifice shows love. Sacrifice shows love. And so therefore, you may want to ask yourself, have you stopped loving? Have you stopped sacrificing? Have you stopped, in your marriage, have you stopped sacrificing for each other? Do you merely tolerate one another? Do you accept the other person for who they are in the Lord? Have you, thought, have you stopped sacrificing for one another? No, no. Understand the love of God brings out sacrifice. And this is how we do it, even as the Bible teaches us in so many portions on the screen. And so the final point we want to look at before we close in prayer, it says there, the very conclusion of it all, that these names were given, it says there in the text, for the Lord's sake. What? I thought it was for my sake. <laughs> yeah, well, it's really not. The Bible's not about you. It's about God. Just want to let you know. Your life will be changed when you realize he's the star. You're just a bit player uh, in this whole thing. Uh, we're the frame pointing to the picture. Yeshua is it all. So we want to understand these names have to do for the sake of Hashem. That is for his purposes of peace and love. For God's purposes. This is the heart of God. This is the plan of God. This is the provision of God in the Messiah. This prefigures the greater peace of Messiah uh, for Israel and the world uh, because of God's love for lost sinners. Uh, therefore, because he loves lost sinners, uh, the, son of, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost because of God's love for us. And when his love constrains our heart, we'll be on the outlook for lost sheep. We'll be caring about hurting people. We'll look to be God's instrument of hope and encouragement and grace to those who are around us as well. And so we see three grounds upon which Messiah 
uh, prefigured, is prefigured in Solomon. First of all, is the great son of David. Uh, secondly, is the earth's wisest person. And then lastly, is God's temple builder. Each of these prefigure, you say, how do you figure that? Because three times Solomon is mentioned in the New Covenant in this regard. And so the first time in Matthew, we see uh, that Yeshua was born uh, from David through Solomon uh, as a son. And so in Matthew 12, we see that someone greater than Solomon, something greater than Solomon, the wisdom of God. Uh, something greater than Solomon is here. And then Acts 7, but it was Solomon who built the house as the temple builder. Those three areas uh, indicate for us uh, the three areas that Yeshua is prefigured in Solomon, fulfilled for our lives. Let's get into it. And so Yeshua is the greater king than Solomon, for Yeshua is the king of kings, lord of lords. He's the lord of glory. Uh, and so he's greater, he's the greater son of David. Yeshua is the greater king than Solomon in holiness. And you say, I don't understand. What do you mean? Uh, if you read the end of the story of Solomon, he started out so well and ended up so corrupted. Uh, what do you mean? Yeshua is a godlier king, for Yeshua never used his authority uh, to disobey the word of God. He never used the authority for self-serving purposes. Listen, men, for those who are heads of the home who are represented here, you have authority for God for the sake of others. Not for self-serving purposes. God has given you authority to care for others, for their upbuilding, for their benefit, not for yourself. And so Yeshua is much God, more godly than Solomon. Solomon used his authority uh, to disobey Torah a thousand times. You say, how did Solomon disobey Torah a thousand times? Because he married a thousand women. You say, is that bad? Your spouse is like God. If one is not enough, a thousand won't help. And so understand, he had a thousand wives. But for Yeshua, there's only one bride. I want all the bride here of Messiah. Raise your hands if you're a bride of Messiah, right where you are. You say, but I'm a guy, it's okay. Uh, for the sake of this, you're also the bride of Messiah. Just want to say, even though there's no marriage in heaven, uh, even though there will be a wedding uh, for the bride of the Lamb, because that'll, that, that basically illustrates, our marriage will illustrate the intimacy we'll enjoy with God forever. But nonetheless, Yeshua has been faithful, and he, Yeshua is the faithfulness of God to Israel, and therefore Yeshua, the greater king, but also greater wisdom than the wisdom of Solomon. Yeshua is great in Solomon's wisdom. Yeshua is the Word of God incarnate. In the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. Yeshua is the wisdom of God for us. Read with me the, uh, on 1 Corinthians 1.24 on the right side of the screen. Let's read together that verse. Here we go. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, the same Messiah is God's power and God's wisdom. Even as the death of Messiah demonstrates the power of God, in the death of Messiah is the wisdom of God. The world cannot understand it, but this is the wisdom of God. The wisdom only God can appreciate in our lives when we live sacrificially, when we care about those who don't even care for themselves. The wisdom of God. Yeshua is God's wisdom made manifest. And therefore, the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. It's what we proclaim, what we testify to in the world. This is how you're wise. You say, what? When you are declaring the Messiah, sharing the good news, there's nothing more important, nothing better, more, nothing more helpful to people than the good news. Out of that good news of Messiah comes every other application for our life. But there is no wisdom apart from the cross of Messiah. There's no wisdom from the sacrifice of Messiah. Only in him is there wisdom and power. And when you try to share some counseling that's apart from the very death of the Messiah, you're giving vain counsel. The best thing you can do is point them to the wonderful counselor. And in him is the true counsel for our life now and forever. So Yeshua is the greater temple than the temple of Solomon. He's greater than Solomon as to the house of God because we have a better sacrifice. All the sacrifices 
that took place uh, in the temple of Solomon, they're all good faith promises. What? Good faith promises. They all anticipated the fulfillment in Messiah's death. Messiah's death is the only sacrifice that counts. It's the sacrifice that paid off on all those good faith promises. You say, what do you mean? When they went to the temple, when they made those sacrifices, it was in faith, trusting God, and God said it would be your atonement, your covering, but it won't be your cleansing. Only the death of Messiah brings cleansing of sin, not just a covering up. And so we want to understand the greater than Solomon has come in this regard. Yeshua indeed is our high priest. And when we, when we read the book of Revelation, I have it up on the screen for you. We read at the, in, in the eternal state, uh, when all things are Shabbat, uh, in the eternal state, uh, then it says the Lamb is the temple. Oh, Solomon rejoices in the truth that it pointed to. And so Messiah fulfills in every way the ministry of the prophet in wisdom, the priest in the temple, and, and king of kings. If Solomon uh, gave David and Bathsheba hope behind, beyond their tragedy, how much more do we have greater hope for victory now and eternal life beyond the grave for greater than Solomon has come? If they had... How much more hope do we have, not only in the here and now, but for eternity to come? What a great God we have. <laughs> to glory be God. To God be that glory. So let's understand Israel. Oh, Israel, if they were to follow Solomon as God's appointed king, how much more should we follow Yeshua, who's greater than Solomon in every way? As the fulfilled prophet, we follow his word as a lamp unto our feet. And so when he teaches us that by faith in him, by trusting in him, by abiding in him, we bear much fruit. By abiding in him, we can now pray for those who despitefully use us. We can pray for those who persecute us. We can love our enemies. We can bless those who curse us by abiding in him. We therefore follow his word as we're abiding in him, trusting in him, and living out his life as a lamp unto our feet indeed. And as our priest, we trust in his perfect sacrifice in which we are complete. We need nothing more. People often say, well, aren't you looking to the signs of the times? No, I'm not looking to signs. I'm looking to the sun. I don't need any circumstances. I'm eagerly awaiting the Messiah to deliver us from the wrath to come. My, my attention is on him. I run this race looking unto Yeshua. This is what we eagerly wait for. Uh, all kinds of circumstances will take place. There will be wars and rumors of wars. We keep our focus on Yeshua, live out the victorious life in the midst of the circumstances, whatever they may be. And as our king of kings, he's seated on the throne of our heart, and his will be done. And therefore, his calling to all of us, as he said through the apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, that we're all called to the Jew first, as well as to the Gentile. This is our purpose. We have our purpose from him. He has taught us. He has told us. He has commanded us. He guides us now. And this authority over us is now seen in how we use our time, our talent, and our treasure. This shows that we're actually trusting him in all those areas we live out his life. And so, therefore, by his authority and promise and sacrifice, we, have, we enjoy eternal glory with him forever. Oh, let us give praise to him and thanksgiving to him. For he is a great and a mighty God who has done great things for us. He is worthy of all praise, all honor, all attribution, all things. May he get the glory in all these things. Because we have a bunch of shlomos here. A bunch of people here who are reminders of what God can do. They are trophies of grace with the forgiveness they have received. Reminding us God's grace is sufficient. Reminding us to trust in the Lord and to follow Yeshua. Let's do that right now. Let's bring him our hearts in prayer. 
and with thanksgiving. Let's bow our hearts before God. It's our custom in our community here. Uh, after the reading of God's word, the study of his word, uh, we now ask the Lord to help us to apply it to our life. First of all, the trust that his will be done. That he is a sovereign God. Even when we foul up, even when we mess up, God's will be done. And so we, we yield to his will. And we entrust all these things to him. We give him all the broken pieces that he might then make a masterpiece of it all. And he is our peace. He has made the two into one. As our community testifies, Jew and Gentile together, a living testimony of what Messiah could do, a testimony to the world of the peace they crave. And he is the love gift that we share shamelessly with everyone. And indeed, the greater then Solomon has come. O oh Lord, be glorified, we pray. And we even cast our cares unto you now. We give you all the difficulties, all the trials, all the failures, all the mistakes. We bring it all to you, Lord. And we just thank you for the cleansing blood of Yeshua the Messiah. And therefore, for the power of God now to live out his life. The wisdom of God to use that power to the glory of God. May your name be glorified and exalted. For all this we give thanks for. For we pray, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach HaNeinu. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. Amen. Amen and amen.